Welcome in to this week's Wednesday Bible study uh, here brought to you by the Union Hill Church of Christ. We're glad that you're tuning in and we hope that it benefits you in your uh, advanced knowledge of God's word and in the application of that word to your life. As always, we want to welcome you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday at seven o'clock. And then on Sunday, the Lord's Day, we assemble for a Bible class hour at 10 a.m., for a worship hour at 11, and then again each Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, except the last Sunday of the month we meet at 2 o'clock following a dinner that we eat together here on the grounds. And so you're always welcome to come and visit with us, and we hope that you'll come and be our honored guest at some day, uh, some point in the very near future. We hope that these studies are going to help you, and we encourage you to, to view all of them we have an additional uh, video already uploaded or already posted uh, prior to this, the Wednesday Bible study. And they all do go in line with this study of the book of Matthew that we introduced last Wednesday. We hope that as we're studying this, that you are going to be benefited by it as we open up God's word and try to recognize what it is we're looking about. You'll notice it is the first quarter study. And as I said last week, we're going to try each week to post two and a half to three hours worth of video that is going to help you understand uh, God's Word. Now, as we come back to our study, do remember that last Wednesday in our Bible study, we had focused on Matthew the man. We wanted to understand a little something about the individual that God used to pin this particular gospel record. And so we did that last Wednesday. In our previous video for this week, we actually looked at the external viewpoint of introduction to the book of Matthew and then got into the internal, focused on where Matthew was going or what he was trying to do and how he was going to accomplish his purpose. You might recall in that previous video, we looked at this internal view. We saw that the book itself seems to be naturally divided into three major sections because of what is said in chapter 4 and verse 12, that Jesus departed into Galilee, and then in 19, 1, he departed from Galilee. And that seems to be natural divisions in the book as Matthew lays out his information. We looked at the introduction points that, that introduced Jesus as a king including a victory over temptation, meaning over the devil who presented that temptation in chapter 4. And then the bulk of the book focused in chapter 4 through chapter 18 on the Galilean ministry, the work that Jesus did in the province of Galilee, one of five provinces that made up the land of Palestine in the first century, which also included Samaria and Judea and you know, those were two parts of of the world that Jesus worked within as well. But Matthew focuses on that Galilean ministry. We kind of introduced why he did that. But that part was divided into three segments as well, teachings, miracles, and reactions. And then from 19 through 27, we focused on the climax of that ministry, the three parts, including the presentation when Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He journeys toward the city, two chapters dedicated to that. Then the time in the city uh, from chapter 21 to chapter 25. And then, of course, the crucifixion in chapter uh, 26 and 27, and then the resurrection in chapter 28. And what we want to do in this video is come back to that middle part, the Galilean ministry, and focus on those three subdivisions. You know, the, the first part, the teachings, focuses on the Sermon on the Mount. The what did Jesus say part. Remember, he claimed to be a king, and so naturally it would be asked, what did he say, what did he do, and how did people respond to that? And you might remember that from the previous video. Well, what I wanted to do in this video was kind of break down this middle portion, these three aspects of the teachings, the miracles, and then the reactions as we uh, focus this part of the Galilean ministry uh, into those three parts. Jesus taught, Jesus wrought, the people thought 
one of the other ways in which we described it. And what we'll find is that each one of these sections then subdivides into 10 parts itself. Interestingly enough, Matthew has a designed program. He has a plan that he is put, putting together. The Galilean ministry happened to be perfect for the laying out of that, that plan of his writing. And he took from the things that Jesus said while in Galilee, from the things Jesus did, and from the reactions of the people there. So how did uh, these things develop in Matthew's book? Well, in the teachings, we'll notice, first of all, the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. Those happen to be the subject matter of the Sunday morning sermons the, the past couple of weeks at Union Hill. We've had three lessons so far dealing with those, and we have one more this coming Sunday as we understand what the Beatitudes were, were presenting. And as Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom, these Beatitudes actually focus on the kingdom subjects. If we might just briefly mention some of these in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, the Beatitudes are so called because they each begin with that term blessed. And the Latin term beati or beatus is the uh, word from which beatitude comes. And that, that Latin term meant blessed or blessed as we sometimes say it. And what Jesus was pronouncing was the highest degree of, of happiness. And the, happy, uh, the, the highest degrees of happiness actually pertain to the subjects of the kingdom. But these are characteristic the, these Beatitudes are expressing certain characteristics of those who would actually be subjects of the king's kingdom. Remember, it's a spiritual kingdom. Thus, we would expect spiritual aspects of the kingdom subjects. And when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's obviously talking about their, their humble nature. They're poor in spirit. That is, they're willing to be led and uh, in, in willing to be led. They are going to, to follow the directions. They're going to do what has been told them to do to enter into the kingdom. You'll notice that he talks about they that mourn, how they'll be comforted. Here he's talking about, as we apply the kingdom principles, he's talking about those who would mourn over sin, understanding the right concept of sin and how the kingdom subject would follow the directions, being humble, being poor in spirit, so as to find forgiveness for those sins, thereby being comforted. Uh, blessed are the meek. The word meek comes from a, a Greek word with a root meaning of equilibrium. And so meekness carries that idea of being balanced in your character. You're going to be balanced in every facet of, of who you are, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, the the makeup of an individual is is actually complex as far as the various aspects, the various qualities, uh, the various emotions, the various mental uh, capacities, the various physical traits, and so forth. But in all of those things, the the kingdom subject, the citizen of the kingdom of the king, is going to maintain balance in all of those. He's going to be steady, or he's going to be an individual who is going to have an equilibrium in, in every attribute. And you take, for example, in the sermon that, that addressed this here at Union Hill, we, we focus on the idea of love as well as righteous indignation, or we might say anger. And as you take those two emotions or those two mental concepts you understand that one cannot overweigh the other. They have to have a harmony. They have to have a balance. There has to be stability among those things. And so the kingdom subject is going to be balanced. He's going to be stable or she's going to be stable in their character. And of course, the other Beatitudes likewise are going to describe the kingdom subject. And and obviously, as we're learning from this and what Matthew is presenting relative to the king and what Jesus taught 
about the kingdom, particularly the subjects who would become part of that kingdom or the citizens of that kingdom, we would have to ask the question, are we poor in spirit? Are we meek? Uh, do we mourn because of sin so as to lead to, to comfort in following the directions to have those sins forgiven? Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness or the justification of God that comes through the gospel? Romans 1, 16 says, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So if God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel, and we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we thus hunger and thirst, we have a strong desire for God's word, we would simply ask the question from the teaching of Jesus here, do we really hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do we really desire God's word so as to understand it, obey it, and be satisfied or filled in following its directions? So the first part of his teaching, the first section uh, which may we even say extends into verse 13 through 16 with the similitudes where he likens the kingdom subjects to salt, to light, and to a city set on a hill regarding their influence. Not only do they have a certain character, that character actually is serving to influence or set an example before the world. Then Jesus delves into moral standards. When it comes to the teachings of Jesus, you'll note in chapter 5, there are several occasions where Jesus says, ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, but I say unto you. And throughout the rest of chapter 5, from verse number uh, 17 through verse number 48, this, this theme is going to go, or this, this repetitive uh, understanding You've heard it said, but I say unto you, a contrasting of the teaching of Jesus with someone else's teaching. And, and some have mistakenly believed that Jesus was contrasting his teaching to that of the law of Moses, but that's not true. What Jesus is addressing here, remember, he says in verse number 20 of Matthew 5, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall, uh, uh, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom principles. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was not based on the law of God. It, it wasn't that they were adhering to the commandments of God versus what Christ was about to present. Rather, they were adhering to the traditions of the fathers. Remember Matthew 15 talked about how they taught for doctrines the commandments of men. So what Jesus is contrasting there in what they have heard versus what he says is the tradition of the elders as held concerning the law as opposed to what Jesus had to say. So where the old law may have said, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. While the old law did claim an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in civil justice, remember the Old Testament had a civil law aspect to it too because it was the law of a nation of people, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And there was a judicial system put in place in which laws were enacted and retribution for the violation of that law or judicial wrath was to be executed. And so an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth related to that judicial wrath or the execution of the penalty of law being broken and that penalty being carried out. Didn't mean God had no mercy. It didn't mean that God did not, did not extend grace. But what it did mean is that there was a law in place when that law was violated, there was a punishment for the violation of that law. But when Jesus said, you've heard that been said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that was based of, uh, concerning the interpretation of that law where personal vengeance was, was taught or was practiced or was uh, even uh, gendered because of a misinterpretation of the law. And Jesus said, but I say unto you, contrasting the righteousness of the Pharisees that pertain to the uh, 
traditions of the fathers. Remember, even Paul said in, in Romans chapter 10 that the Jews went about to establish their own righteousness and had not had not submitted to the righteousness of God. So in the righteousness of the Pharisees, it was their own. It was not God's. And that's what Jesus was contrasting. So the moral standard, the correct behavior, you know, whether it be in dealing with marriage and the look of lust, verse number 27 and 28, you've heard that been said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, the physical act of adultery. Sexual interaction between uh, two parties, one of which, or at least one of which is married. But Jesus said, I say unto you, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Where the Pharisees' tradition may have been, as long as you don't engage in the physical act, Jesus says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And out of the heart, the man sins. And so Jesus focuses on that heart. We think about what he said in, in verse number 33. You've heard that it been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself. Thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. I say unto you, swear not at all. The oaths that were made, they were classified in different ways as to how strong or weak the oath was and whether you were obligated to, to keep it. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your yea, yea, your yea be yea and your nay nay, speaking to the moral standard of the day. And so we might focus on that in our Wednesday Bible study and not only say, do we meet the characteristics of a kingdom subject presented in the Beatitudes, such as being poor in spirit or being humble and willing to be directed or led by God's word, but also do we behave in a way that is appropriate to a kingdom subject? As a citizen of the kingdom, are we adhering to the king's teaching relative to moral standards? Even to the point where he says in, in chapter 5, in the context of verse 38 through 48, concerning our actions toward one another, the, the thirst for personal vengeance being uh, condemned and love being invoked, and then therefore being perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Our behavior should conform to the character of the Father in heaven, not to the traditions of the earthly fathers that may not coincide with God's law. So Jesus says here are the moral standards. Number three, under the teachings, he talks about religious motives. Now on the screen, we have three letters, A, P, and F. And, and that's only for the sake of, of time. Those letters represent alms, prayers, and fasting. And you might recall in, in Matthew chapter 6, in that middle chapter of this three set, this three set of chat or this set of three chapters, that Jesus is presenting his teaching, what he said. He addressed almsgiving, prayers, and fasting. And of course, he he contrasts real genuine motives, true motives, with the motives that the Pharisees enacted these activities upon. They did it for to be seen of men whether it was almsgiving, to receive the praise of men. Let men see what I'm giving, wherein I am helping others so that they can praise me. Not for the sake of helping those that were in need, but for the sake of being seen helping those who are in need so that I can receive the accolades. That was their motive. Even in their prayers, they would stand in the street corners. They would, they would make broad their phylacteries. They would do certain things so as to present themselves in their prayer life for to be seen of men, so that men could say, oh, how religious they are. Listen to how they pray. And then even in fasting, they would configure themselves. They would contort themselves. They would make their fasting known to all. And Jesus basically condemns the motives. It wasn't that almsgiving was bad, it wasn't that prayer was bad, and it wasn't that fasting was condemned. But the motives behind what they were doing is what Jesus addressed. And the same with you and I. What is our motive for service? What is your motive for serving God? Let no, Notice what he says here, in like in verse number 2 of chapter 6. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. 
They did it so that men could sound their praises. They just liked the pat on the back. But Jesus said, do it in secret so that your father that sees it in secret can reward thee openly. Verse number four, same thing when you pray, same thing when you fast. It's not for others to see and to glorify you. It's so that you can do the right thing as a citizen of the kingdom before God, even in helping your fellow man through almsgiving or communicating with God through prayer, or even in that spiritual um, dedication and, and renewal that they would use fasting to accomplish. And so Jesus addresses religious motives. And we might say to ourselves right now, what are our motives? Why do we render service, religious service, at all, and let it be better than that for which the Pharisees rendered it. The fourth section dealt with mammon worship. Uh, we might focus on that, that idea of treasure. Where is your treasure? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if you notice that section that we would refer to as mammon worship from chapter 6 and verse 19 through 24, as Jesus addresses that matter of the treasure, and he has said, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, the reason is where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And the, the treasure there is representative of that which, which we set our heart upon, which is important to us, which is valuable to us. And if you put value only on the things of this earth, and in essence end up worshiping that, well, then you're not going to have that for which you really desire because with that that pertains to this world, it's corruptible. It decays. It rots. It can be stolen or removed from your possession. But those spiritual treasures laid up in heaven, they cannot be touched. They cannot be removed from your, your possession so long as you keep or maintain your treasure in heaven. So Jesus addresses mammon worship. He addresses temporal cares. We might say anxiety versus trust. In chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, if you, if you read through those verses, he focuses on the idea that you don't need to have anxiety or worry over the things of this life, like what you're going to put on, what you're going to eat, what, where, where you're going to live. Now, it doesn't mean that those things aren't important. And it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be uh, considered. After all, Paul said, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And, and one thing about the New Testament being from God, it is not contradictory. Thus, there is, a, there is an explanation between what Jesus said here regarding anxiety or take no thought for what you'll put on or what what you're going to eat and so forth. And Paul saying, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And the point Jesus is making there in verse 34, when he says, take no, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take care of the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He's talking about that idea of anxiety or worry. And rather than having anxiety or worry over those temporal things, we need to trust in God and seek first the kingdom of heaven. So in the teachings of Jesus, he has addressed the character of the kingdom subjects. He's addressed the behavior or the moral standards of those kingdom subjects. He has addressed the motive or motives of those kingdom subjects. He has addressed the things of greatest importance to those kingdom subjects in where their treasure is. And now he's addressed the matter that as a kingdom subject, a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual citizen of that kingdom, we live in a temporal world. And what is our relationship to this world as a subject of the spiritual kingdom of Christ? And it's not to worry and have anxiety over the temporal things, but rather to trust in him and put the spiritual kingdom first. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things shall be added unto you and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In the teachings of Christ, he also mentions the social discernment, a passage that is often taken out of context or misapplied because they don't see the full 
panoramic view of what Matthew has said. Uh, this is one of the dangers of taking one verse and, and not looking at it in its fuller context. Judge not that ye be not judged. That deals with social discernment. And he talks about the judgment that is weighed or meted out and that which shall come to us as well. And it talks about that interaction with a brother who has a, an issue in his life, a wrong in his life that needs to be corrected, and we too having uh, some uh, some matter in our life that needs to be corrected and, and actually presenting it in a way that it's it's greater than what we're trying to fix in, the, in our brother. But the matter of social discernment, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, judge not that ye be not judged, and, and you take it, lift it out of the context and say, see, Jesus said, don't ever judge. That's not what Jesus said. Because in the very context Jesus is going to lay down some teaching that requires you to make discernment or to make judgment. Like in when he says in verse number six, not to cast your pearls before swine. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Obviously, there's a spiritual teaching here. He's not talking necessarily about literal pearls being cast before swine, but in a spiritual sense, don't you have to make a, a discernment or a judgment as to whether or not you're casting your pearls before swine or whether or not you're giving the crumbs to the dogs? And, and then even when he, he talks later about false teachers in verse 15, he says, beware of false prophets. Doesn't it require a judgment in order to discern between a true prophet or a true teacher and a false teacher. So obviously Jesus isn't condemning all judging, but based on the context, he is condemning hypocritical judging, that of which we would discern an indiscretion in another and, and censure them when, it, as a matter of fact, there is an indiscretion in our life that is yet to be corrected. And so Jesus teaches regarding social discernment, censuring and indiscretions as we interact one with another. Jesus dealt with a sentence summary or a passage that sums up life in verse number 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and prophets. Summing up, as we call it, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You treat others. It didn't say the way they're treating you. It said the way you would want them or desire them to treat you as you would that men do to you. What you would want for others to give to you. If you want others to extend you mercy, then by all means extend them mercy. If you want others to forgive you, then by all means be forgiving of them. If you want others to love and appreciate you, then by all means, you must love and appreciate them. And it's not, it's not based upon whether or not they are loving and respecting you, but rather that's what you desire from them toward you. So you extend that to them. The golden rule of life, do unto others. And, and Jesus in that summed up our interaction with others, a sentence summary. Jesus also gave forth two alternatives in the broad and the narrow way, and he gave a final warning. In, in the latter portion, he talked about false prophets. We mentioned verse number 15 uh, when he said, beware of false prophets. We noticed that he talked about false profession. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Here's a great warning. Not everyone is teaching the truth. You have to discern the truth from error who is a true teacher and who is not. Jesus then said, you have to be careful of your profession. You, you have to uh, analyze and, and determine whether you are living up to your profession. You can profess that, that you know Christ. You can profess that you love Christ. But if you're not doing the will of the Father in heaven, if you're not obeying the Father in heaven, then you're not living up to that profession, which would make it a false profession. He talked about a false foundation, those who build upon the sand versus those who build upon a rock, and the distinction between the two. 
is in hearing and doing what he has said. You hear these sayings of mine and do them. You're like that wise man that built on the rock that had that solid foundation. But if you hear them and don't do them, then you're like that man who built on a, a, a very uh, weak foundation, uh, a very uh, uh, unsupportive foundation, and lost everything. So in the teachings of Jesus, he, he says a lot about the kingdom here. Remember, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so all of this teaching is going to focus on the nature of the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom subjects, the behavior of the kingdom subjects, the motives of the kingdom subjects, the worship of the kingdom subjects, the disposition of the kingdom subjects between trust and anxiety, the interaction of the kingdom subjects one with another in social discernment, and the treatment one of another with that sentence summary. And it's going to end with a choice. The kingdom subject is going to choose the narrow way that leads to life. All others are choosing the broad way that leads to destruction. And then there is the warning. Don't be and listen to false teachers or prophets. Don't be one who makes a false profession. And don't be one who builds on a false foundation. The teachings of Jesus. Well, then you also have the miracles of Jesus. And when you look at these passages, take, take like Matthew 8 and verse 16. You notice up in the, the top right corner of the screen, there's two verses out of these three chapters, 816 and 935. Notice in 816, it says, When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Chapter 9, chapter 9 and verse number 35 says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Notice those two verses say that Jesus was healing every disease, every sickness, as he is healing all or he is healing every sickness, what Matthew is going to do is choose 10 of them. And there's going to be a clear distinction, and I'll point it out in just a minute, that these are grouped together. There's going to be three groups, the 10 miracles that he is going to choose out of everyone that Jesus did in, in healing all and every sickness. There's going to be 10 that he selects. In the first three, they were problems that affected the whole body. And remember here with the miracles, we're asking what Jesus did. Jesus taught, chapter 5 through 7, but now Jesus wrought. What was he doing that would demonstrate that he is the Messiah? What did the Messiah teach? What did the Messiah do? And all of this in confirmation of what he taught. Think about what he has done here in in the miracles that affect the whole body. He cleansed the leper in chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. He clean, uh, healed the centurion servant of palsy, chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. And he cured Peter's mother-in-law of a great fever. Classifications of fevers, there were two. Peter's mother-in-law had the most severe classification of fever, having a great fever. And yet in all of that, Jesus healed them. And there were some remarkable things that Jesus said or did here. When you read through these first 15 verses of, of chapter 8, you think about the marvelous things or remarkable things that Jesus said or did himself in healing them. Like he, he said, go thy way, show thyself to the priest. Or he said, I will be thou clean. Verse number three, and the man was clean. Um, the, the centurion was willing to go to Jesus, but he, when Jesus said, I'll follow you to your home, uh, he said, just say it. And Jesus said, of that man, I've not found so great faith in Israel. And of course, Jesus then said to him, go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. 
And lo and behold, the same hour at which Jesus uttered those words, the centurion's servant was healed. Peter's mother-in-law was sick of a fever, uh, happened to be a great fever. But as he touched her, what did Jesus do? He touched her and the fever left her and she arose. You've been sick, I'm sure. You've run fever, I'm sure, within your life at some point in time. And you know that when that fever leaves, maybe you had the flu, maybe you even had the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and, and it was accompanied by fever. And you know as well as I do that you didn't instantly get up from that point as though you had never had fever and be at full strength. A fever, that, that rise in the body temperature has a way of depleting the energy. It has a way of incapacitating us to which it takes time to recover. Not in Peter's mother-in-law's case. As soon as Jesus touched her, she was immediately healed and went about serving. So notice the remarkable things that Jesus said or did. In the third or second section, you have three affecting natural, spiritual, and moral. Um, and what we mean by that, the, the sphere of these miracles involves the natural world, the spiritual, and the moral realm. What do we mean? Well, in chapter 8, verse 23 through 27, Jesus healed or uh, calmed the storm, rather, affecting the realm of nature, the natural realm. Immediately, there was a calm upon the sea. Notice, then he cured the demonics in chapter 8, verse 28 through 34. The spiritual realm, the unclean spirits, he healed. Then you deal with the moral realm because he cured a man of palsy. But notice what he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Whatever the nature of this sickness was in some kind of paralysis, it was the result of sins that this man had committed of which Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Of course, the great question would be asked, who can forgive sin, but, but God only? No truer statement. Jesus was God incarnate. And as he could pronounce the sins forgiven, he demonstrated his miraculous power in the moral realm when he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And in those passages, in those three miracles, chapter 8 and verse 23 through chapter 9 and verse number 8, notice the remarkable utterances about Jesus, where in those first three it was things said and done by Jesus now you note the things that are said about Jesus regarding those miracles. So Jesus uh, <clears throat> is going to, to calm the sea. Notice verse 27 of chapter 8. The men marveled, that is his disciples, his apostles marveled. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Even the winds and sea obey him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have that, that idea of the remarkable things said about Jesus. In what Jesus did, people took note and said, what manner of man is this? And you can do that with, with each of those. Uh, verse number 33, they, they went and told everyone what had happened as, as they had... Uh, been healed of that demonic possession or in the curing of, of the, the palsy. Verse number eight of chapter nine says, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. What they saw demonstrated in Jesus was, was truly something that only God could affect. So what did they say about Jesus? Uh, in those three things. And then the, the final sec, uh, segment, there are four local or organic ailments of the body. And what we mean by that is where the first three affected the entirety of the body, like, like leprosy or palsy. In this one, you have specific uh, local ailments. The woman with the hemorrhaging of blood in chapter 9, verse 18 through 22. 
you have the ruler's daughter who was dead, an organic ailment in, of the body in the sense that no life within it. Now you just have the, the, the earthen matter, and no soul, no spirit within that body. And yet Jesus will bring her back to life. The blind man given sight in chapter 9, verse 17 through 21. Again, a local ailment focused just on the eyes. He was unable to see, and yet Jesus healed that blindness. You have the dumb demonic healed. And what we mean by dumb there is that he could not speak. He, he was unable to talk, thus an impediment of the tongue, local ailment of the body, once again, that was caused by the demonic possession. And yet Jesus was able to heal him. And again, you have a, a culminative aspect here. You, you have a, a, a climaxing of the power of Jesus, especially in the raising of the dead and and even the giving of sight and making the the dumb to speak. These are things that that just could not happen apart from God, and yet Jesus produced these miracles. We might even say that in in these things we want to notice the breaks. Uh, the reason these are subdivided into a set of three, three, and then four, in chapter 8, verse 18 through 22, you'll notice that there's a break where Jesus addresses the multitude. He has something to say to them relative to these miracles. Chapter 9, verse 10 through 17, he's going to answer the Pharisees and John's disciples. And so these miracles give way to, to teaching or to um, words from him regarding uh, their their response or or their lack of response, and thus subdividing these. We might then mention that chapter ten he imparts power. We said the miracles from eight to ten. In chapter eight and nine, we have those ten miracles that are actually done. Chapter ten he talks about the. Uh, limited commission as he sends his disciples out by twos under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they are going to call uh, the, the lost sheep of Israel back to God. Much to the extension of the work that John the baptizer had been doing in turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and so forth and making those straight paths. They're going to continue that work in calling men uh, to God what we call the limited commission because its scope was only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But under this heading of the miracles, one of the reasons that that event by Matthew is recorded is because of the demonstration of the power of Jesus that not only did he uh, work these miracles, he was able to impart that miraculous power to others that they too could work those miracles. And so what did Jesus say? Chapter 5 through 7, we had some of his teaching as he taught in Galilee. We have 10 of his miracles. Didn't limit to these 10 because chapter 8, verse 16, and chapter 9, verse 35 said that these were extensive in, in their working power. So many healed and all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. It wasn't beyond the power of Jesus to to heal or to affect natural, spiritual, and moral realms, and then to impart that power to others, certainly uh, he demonstrated himself to be the Messiah through the miracles that confirmed the teaching that he did. And then, of course, we can talk about the reactions. The third part of this section from 11 through 18 is going to focus on the reaction that man had toward him. And you'll notice here that, that there is a listing of 10 individuals or groups that Matthew is going to address or that he's going to speak to. You have John the Baptist in chapter uh, 11, verse 2 through 15. He sins, he's in prison. And you might note back in chapter 4, when Jesus departed into Galilee and began preaching the gospel of the kingdom, it corresponded to the moments that John was thrown into prison. 
And so when John was put in prison, Jesus departed into Galilee and began preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So John is in prison. He hears what Jesus is doing, and he sends uh, an, an ambassage. He sends some of his disciples to question him. Art thou he, or look we for another? And we might classify John as undecided in that moment. Of course, no indecision after this point, but undecided, the original reaction. You have that generation. Um, just focused on in, in chapter 11, verse 16 through 19, just simply the people of that day. And we would classify them as unresponsive. Unresponsive in the sense, if you look at verse 16, he says, what shall I liken uh, this generation is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, saying, We have piped unto you and have not danced. We have mourned unto you and not, learned, uh, not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man, uh, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Here is a generation who sits and observes. On one hand, they're going to say one thing. On the other hand, they'll say the opposite, and they never do respond one way or the other. They didn't listen to John. They said, you know, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a strange man. He has a devil because he, he doesn't eat and drink. But then Jesus comes, and he eats uh, with the feast that Matthew made, eats with publicans and sinners. And they, they say, well, he's a wine bibber. And they don't make a decision either way. So they're unresponsive. You have the Galilean cities, chapter 11, verse 20 through 30, that are unrepentant. They see the great works, Capernaum, Bethsaida, see great works that would have created repentance even in cities like Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah. But they would not repent. So unrepentant cities. The Pharisees, unreasonable. Chapter 12, verse 2 says, When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Unreasonable. Not considering what the law said and, and what Jesus, you know, here's one who came teaching. Here's one with the great miracles that he did that the people would marvel and even understand that God had, had provided that great power. And then at the same time, they would say he, he's doing things unlawful. He's not keeping the law. Wouldn't he know the law? Wouldn't it be obvious that God was with him? They were unreasonable people. They, they couldn't do the simple arithmetic to put two and two together and recognize what was right in front of them. Again, the multitudes, undiscerning. Similarly, uh, chapter 13, he spoke in parables because it was given to his disciples to know the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, but to them it was not given. They were undiscerning. They couldn't figure it out. They heard these parables that Jesus said, and they might even hear him say, the kingdom of heaven is like an unto. But they just couldn't figure it out. Undiscerning. The Nazarenes were unbelieving because a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. They knew Jesus. They had heard Jesus. They knew his upbringing. They knew his family. And including his family, they didn't believe in him. Herod was unintelligent. He didn't know what to make of it. He thought Jesus was John the baptizer come back to life in chapter 14. The Jerusalem scribes were unconciliatory. In chapter 15, in verse 1 through 20, there is a confrontation when his disciples are accused of transgressing the tradition of the elders in eating uh, bread without washing their hands. They would not... They would not hear and understand the teaching of Jesus. So unconciliatory. The Pharisees and Sadducees into chapter 16, verse 1 through 12, were simply unrelenting. They just continued to attack Jesus. They continued to uh, attempt to thwart his efforts. But then, of course, the 12, they had a glad recognition. And you recall in, in chapter 16 when Jesus said to his disciples, but whom say ye that I am? Now men were saying he's a great prophet like Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the other prophets. But Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew and, and others 
had had a a long duration to hear Jesus, to see his works, in which Peter could lead them in concluding, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What were the reactions? Well, from some, they weren't good. But from the twelve, there was a glad recognition in all that they saw and all that they observed in Jesus. Now, with most of these, not John the baptizer, he was put to death by Herod, not the 12, because they had a glad recognition. But with all of these others, the un gives way to anti or aggressive hostility. It wasn't just that they were unresponsive. That generation began aggressively hostile activity in order to put Jesus to death. The Pharisees not only were unreasonable and later unrelenting, they became, became anti-Jesus, and they aggressively were hostile toward him, even to clamor for his death. We might ask this with the ending of, of the thought in this lesson. What's your reaction to Jesus? You hear what he teaches. You see the confirmation of that teaching and the, the grand miracles that he did. What he said and did, and, and what the people remarked about him, you you see his power. So how do you respond to him? Do you take his teaching and implement it in your life? Do you become one who humbly follows the directions of God in order to seek comfort in, in the forgiveness of sin? Are you an individual who will seek that equilibrium in character, that you will maintain that stability? and hunger and thirst after the righteousness of God? Or will you too be unresponsive, unrepentant, unreasonable, undiscerning, unbelieving, unintelligent, unconciliatory, and unrelenting? Or will you take that which Matthew presents and with a glad recognition say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then render obedience unto him? I would encourage you to, to go back and read again Matthew 5 through 18. Think about that Galilean ministry and then obey, obey King Jesus. God bless you as you continue to study.